Thank you very much. We ex have Councilwoman Price. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to my colleagues for speaking, and thank you to my colleagues who brought this item forward, and Councilwoman Gonzalez for bringing this item forward and for giving us the presentation. Um, I know that this is something that she feels genuinely passionate about, and I respect that. Um, and I think that there are a, a lot of issues that were raised tonight that are incredibly worthy of consideration and talking about, and I want, I want to talk about those a little bit. Um, I also want to thank the folks from Unite Here um, because they have taken the time to meet with me and they've educated me on the topic and they've asked me a lot of questions. And from day one, I've been very honest with them about my concerns. Um, and I have to be honest, I still have those concerns today about aspects of the uh, proposed ordinance. So I do have a few questions um, and I, I think I'll direct them to city staff to the extent that city staff can answer them. Um, but then if city staff can't answer them, I think I, I wanna raise the questions and hear from my colleagues. Um, so in reading the, the item that was filed um, tonight, it looks to me, I know that Councilman Gonzalez in her presentation talked about the issue of safety and the issue of controlling or limiting, res regulating workloads go hand in hand. I personally am having difficulty with that nexus and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues of what that nexus is. And what I mean by that is, if we were to put all the safety measures into place, the panic buttons, the notices, um, the every s type of support, the training, everything that we can do, which, which I think is absolutely important. The public safety aspects of it, I think are, I have zero issues with them. I'm completely 1000% in support of the panic buttons, doing everything that we can to make sure that women and men are safe in their work environment. Um, I think that's really important. But reducing the workloads, so limiting the, the number of square feet that a person cleans, will that make them less likely to be the victim of sexual assault? And that's what I don't understand. And so I would like to hear how, how is that? Is it, is it because if, if they're cleaning more, then they don't have, I, I, I don't understand if, if they're cleaning less, then how are they more able to prevent a sexual assault from happening. So I, I can't see the nexus and so I just, so that's just something I'm putting out there as a concern because I think to me, in my opinion, they are, I understand they're being brought as a, as a package of issues, but it's, you know, we have a test that we do in legal analysis that we say, but for this, that wouldn't happen. So can we say, but for them working more square footage than they should, a sexual assault wouldn't happen. We, we can't say that. So to me, whether you're cleaning 2,000 square feet or 7,000 square feet, you still have the same risk of coming into a room with a man who, or a woman, or anybody else who is drunk, um, has bad intentions, um, is disrespectful of you, as Nada pointed out, is, is on a vacation or something and that has no inhibitions. Whether you're cleaning 2,000 square feet or 7,000 square feet, that client doesn't know the difference of that. So if they're going to attack you, it doesn't matter how many square feet you're cleaning, they're still gonna attack you. So I, I think we really need to be thinking, and maybe I'm missing it, I'm, I'm more than happy to listen, but I just don't know what that nexus is. I'm sure I am. So I, that's why I said I'm looking forward to, to listening and, and having a civilized debate about it. So I, I really would love to hear more about that. Um, the question that I would have for our police department, I guess, and I don't know if the chief is here. Chief, I know there was a, um, a staff report produced with some data um, based on questions that council was asking. And I think one of the questions that was asked was, what are the number of um, sexual assaults that have been reported? And look, I'm a prosecutor. I know that m most sexual assaults go unreported. That is, that is absolutely true. I, there no issues whatsoever with that. Having said that, we did have two incidents of reported um, activities that were violations or alleged violations of the law, one against a male and one against a female in the period of time that we studied. Is that correct? 
That's correct. Okay. Do we have any data that says that people are more likely to be assaulted if they're working in a hotel with 100 rooms versus working at a hotel with less than 100 rooms? I don't know of uh, any information like that, or at least I haven't been exposed to that. Okay. That, another, I mean, one of the things that concerns me, too, is if generally people who stay at hotels are more likely to commit sexual assaults. I would think that would be true for motels or even hotels under 100 rooms. I could be wrong, and again, I'm, I'm open to hearing if that's that data, but m my curiosity is why aren't we trying to protect workers at hotels for under 100 rooms? So I guess that's not, that's not really a, a question. That's not really, I guess that's not really a question for the chief, but maybe I, I, I'm more, I think we should adopt a policy tonight to put into place safety measures for all of our housekeepers. But I think we should do it for all hotels. I really do. It doesn't matter if you have 10 rooms or if you have 300 rooms. If we want to protect housekeepers, we should protect them regardless of whether they work for a national chain or not. Um, so the, the other um, question I would have for the city attorney and... Um, and I don't know if, if you know this, but I, one of the comments was that there was no litigation that resulted out of similar statutes passed in Emeryville and other cities. Do you know if that's true? Because that's not the research I did, and I could be wrong, but I'm just curious if you know anything about that. Uh, I'm probably not the expert on it, but we did look at Emeryville, and I don't believe that they had the um, panic button issue. They passed an ordinance that had a square footage oh, okay. cleaning uh, requirement. Seattle had an initiative that had the uh, both the um, notice requirements and a cleaning uh, limitation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so with, with either of them, was there any litigation, if you know? It, it, Yes, I do know, and, and yes, there was litigation in both um, situations. In Seattle, there was a challenge under preemption issues um, as to the um, square footage and cleaning. Uh, Seattle, and that was under the, uh, I believe it's called the Washington Industrial Safety and Health Act. Uh, and there the court found that uh, there was not preemption that the city of Seattle, the language in that statute was, um, did not preempt the city of Seattle from uh, issuing that regulation and limiting the square footage. And then there was also uh, challenges on constitutional basis as to the list. And in that case, the court found that the challenge was a facial challenge and the, um, the court found that there was no facial challenge, that it was constitutional, but they left open the question of as an as-applied challenge, that there was no list and there were no people on the list as of the time of the oral argument. Okay, I understand. And do you have any idea how much those those suits cost the cities or how, how significant they were, if at all? I mean, lawsuits are common, so that's certainly not a deterrent from us engaging in good policy, but I'm just asking the question. That, that's certainly not, but the, um, my information from the city of Emeryville is they spent approximately uh, seven hundred fifty to $800,000 in defending their suit. I do not have that similar information for the city of Seattle. Okay. Um, the, I, I, I want to stay on the topic of the safety concerns because then I have a few questions on the workload concerns. On the safety concerns, um, in, on page two of the item, um, it, it talks about providing notice to hotel employees, um, requiring hotel employers to provide notice to the employees prior to starting their scheduled work of any guests on the list of alleged harassers or a sex offender. So. I have a couple of questions about this, and really it comes down to privacy. So if someone is um, a convicted sexual offender and required to register as a sex offender pursuant to Penal Code Section 290, the law gives them the right to stay at a hotel. Um, that the law just allows them to stay at a hotel. What I'm concerned about is alleging violations of sexual misconduct and that person ending up on some sort of a list. Um, and the reason I, I worry about that, I'm sorry, that, it's not in the item? 
It says, of any guest on the list of alleged harassers. So, okay, so maybe I guess my question would be, it says here that there's going to be a list of uh, alleged harassers. So if, if that is actually in the item on page two, I'm, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm just reading the item. If that actually is on the item, then my question would be, who is making the allegation? Where is the list going to be maintained? Does the allegation have to be corroborated like it would in a, you know, a criminal justice setting? And what privacy information of that guest would be made available pursuant to that list. So I, I could be wrong. Maybe it's not on there. Um, regarding uh, workloads, so there's uh, a lot of the comments we heard tonight, and in my meetings with Unite here, one of the things that they said was that it's important to regulate square footage of hotel rooms because hotel rooms of today have a very different realities than hotel rooms in the past. Heavier mattresses are used. The pillows need to be um, treated with different care because of the quality of the pillows. More glass is used in the room, requiring more wiping down. And so that makes sense to me that the workload, the time you're spending in the room might be longer. But in looking at the item on page three, what it says is that the square footage limitation, it says this limitation should apply to any combination of spaces, including guest rooms and suites, meeting rooms or hospitality rooms, and apply regardless of the furniture, equipment, or amenities in any room. So I guess my question would be, does this mean that if a person is cleaning a banquet room, does that go into the 4,000 square feet calculation? Um, and the reason I ask that is because I'm certainly not an expert in this industry, which is probably why I have concerns about us regulating uh, workloads in this industry, but the arguments that were made to me by Unite Here had to do specifically with hotel rooms, and that's not how the item is written, so I, I'd like some clarity on whether that applies to all rooms and all spaces. And I know these are kind of nuanced details that, that aren't very exciting to talk about, but nevertheless, they're, they're questions that I have. Um, in regards to, uh, I did have a question regarding the protections about workload that we provide to our own city employees. Um, other than what we go through with OSHA, do we have any limitations on the workloads of our own employees that are city, and that's for the city manager, that are city regulations not having to do with OSHA? Like, do we limit the number of police reports a police officer can write? Or do we, you know, do we have anything like that that has nothing to do with OSHA? Most of our, our regulations come to us through our MOUs um, and our meet and confers, whether it's um, whichever of our 11 organizations that we work with. Certainly, as you mentioned, we do have um, OSHA regulations in our fleet and um, public works departments. There's DOT regulations for our refuse department on how many hours a refuse driver can work or how many, you know, how many hours per day. We certainly have other regulations through MOUs on our fire department. We have four-man crews instead of three-man crews. Um, and we limit how many hours in a row a, fire a, fireman, a firefighter can work. Same thing with a PD officer. But most of the limitations that we have would be through um, our memorandums of understanding when we um, go through our labor contracts with our organizations. Okay. And, and do you know, um, Mr. West, again, and I know this is kind of an un unfair question to ask you because this isn't a staff item, but um, do you know if there are overtime requirements and things that are regulated through the state that we have to follow for our own employees? Yes, um, FLSA. We have to require. We have to provide overtime um, when people work certain hours and things, and that's regulated um, by the state. Yes. Okay. And and again, since this isn't a staff initiated item, I'm not sure who to ask the question of. But I, I don't. How many hotels have mandatory overtime? Because I've not heard of too many that have mandatory overtime. So I'd like to know the answer to that question if anyone has it. And um, of course, anti-retaliation, I'm 1,000% supportive of that. People should not be getting retaliated for advocating for their own rights or for engaging in a collective bargaining um, association, which I've been a member of for 18 years. I'm fully supportive of that. And, and they shouldn't be retaliated for, for involved, getting involved in that activity. Um, in regards to the workload regulations, I, I will say one thing. I mean, um, 
I know this was presented and has been presented a lot as a woman's bill, but I will, I will tell you guys one thing, and I can already anticipate what the reaction is going to be, but I'm going to speak genuinely and I'm going to speak from the heart. I am a woman, and I am a working woman, and it is very, very important to me that I be given equal pay for the equal work that I do in my work environment. And what that means to me is I don't need any accommodation in terms of the number of hours I work or the type of assignments that my employer gives me in my job, which is a male-dominated job. I can do every single thing my male counterparts can do, and I expect to be paid exactly the same as my male counterparts because I will work exactly the same hours that they would work. And so perhaps I'm missing something here, but if we're going to regulate workloads, we should be regulating workloads for men and women, not just for women. We are equal in every way. Whatever a man can do, whether it's in the battlefield, in a, in a mechanic shop, in an operating room, a woman can do too, and she can do it at the same level, and I would argue in some cases better. Um, so, so for me, I, 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 I think there are aspects of this proposed ordinance that are fantastic, and I would be, and I want to hear comments from my colleagues. I mean, no disrespect in expressing my genuine opinions on this. I am engaging in this debate in the spirit of civility and respect, respecting my colleagues and understanding that we may not agree on everything. I will tell you, if there was a will, I'd be ready to vote on the safety issues right now and make that an ordinance. Um, I have concerns about the workload conditions. I shared a story with a couple of um, the folks from Unite here who came to see me today. And again, I'm sure there's going to be internal and external eye rolling as I share this story. But I think it's an important story to share. I flew back from Montreal on Sunday night with my husband. We were seated at the back of the plane. There were 33 rows. We were in row 32. And so we got to spend a lot of time with the flight attendants. I'm kind of chatty, and I talk to anybody who will talk to me. Uh, my husband won't. So I was talking to the flight attendant. And um, I, she doesn't know I'm a council member. She certainly doesn't know about Claudia's Law. But I, I asked her, I said, well, how do you like these international trips? And she said, we, we actually really don't like international trips because when we fly international, the flight's a little bit longer, and people eat more on the plane, so they put more things in the seat back. There's always crumbs and things on the floor, and so when we deplane, the effort and the work that's required by the flight attendants to get the, ready, the plane ready in a short period of time for the next group of passengers is very cumbersome. It's a really hard process. It's, it's hard cleaning for them. They don't like it. They prefer the one-hour flights because people don't eat full meals in the one-hour flight. And so I was thinking to myself, obviously this woman doesn't know what I do, but I was thinking to myself, what would happen next if the airline industry union came to us and said, we want you to regulate the number of international airplanes that our flight attendants have to clean per day. Or if any other industry came to us and said, we want you to regulate, and maybe they're not an industry that's represented by a union. Maybe it's just a group of employees at a, at a car wash or at a nursery or whatever the case may be who say, you know what, we feel overworked. What are we going to say to them? That, I'm sorry, your industry is not as thriving as the hotel industry, so we're not going to get involved? Or your interest, whoever's representing you, is not as significant to us, so we're not going to worry about you right now. Or there's less than 100 of you, so sorry, you're on your own. Um, I just think that's not fair. So, it, so in my opinion, if we're going to do this, then let's be prepared to really do this. We can't say yes to one class. One class of employees. I mean, I was just thinking, what about the janitors and the chefs and the people who work the front desk? Like, what, aren't they going to be sitting there saying, well, what about my workload? You know, when we have a big convention 
and nobody's, I'm having to, you know, be standing on my feet the whole time at the front door dealing with entitled people who, you know, are upset that I'm not getting their bags. I mean, what about those people? So, so for me, I, I don't know why we're picking this one classification and not everybody. These are just concerns I have. I remain completely open-minded. These are genuine questions that I have. So we all work hard. You're right. So I think it's really important that we allow one another. This is a democracy. And one of the beautiful things about our country is that as long as we're engaging in civilized and respectful debate, we are in a, in a room that respects democracy and differences of opinions. And just because we don't all agree on everything all of the time doesn't mean what someone has to say is funny or rude or not worthy of consideration. Everything everyone said in this room tonight is worthy of consideration, including what I had to say. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. We're going to, uh, we have definitely a lot of folks lined up, so I'm going to go through them here in a minute. But just want, as a reminder, obviously, let make sure that everyone, that everyone on the council, regardless of their opinions, respected and that we're obviously listening to what folks are saying. So, Councilmember Austin. 